Hi, Nisa. Hi, uh, welcome to the Digital Drop. Uh, Thank you. Great, great to have you here. We've been keen on, on getting me. you on the on the podcast. Um, so b- before we we get started, it'd be useful, I think, to our audience if you just told us briefly a little bit about about yourself and uh, and Gem A. Uh, of course, of course. I'll tell more about myself. Um, well, yeah. tell more about Gem A than myself, eh? But. Um, um, so I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Gemological Association of Great Britain. It's Gemological Gemstones. Uh, in the past I've had people um, uh, assume that it's actually germs, but no, it's nothing to do with germs. <laughs> it's actually gemstones. Um, we are a professional and membership organisation established in 1908, so we've got quite a strong brand and quite a strong and rich history. Um, Gem A was uh, formed um, as a result of um, uh, synthetic rubies that were first pro- and synthetic emeralds that were first produced in London um, and this concern that the trade had about how do you distinguish between what's a natural gemstone and what's a synthetic gemstone and that was where the Gemological Association was born from. Um, this idea that you know we need to develop professional training and professional qualifications to help upskill the trade and help them understand uh, and dis- distinguish between what's a natural gemstone and what's a synthetic gemstone and that was when our first diploma was delivered around um, the early early 1900s um, which is the uh, the foundation and gemology diploma that we deliver today so it's got quite a long history um, quite a rich history in that sense so um, essentially we are all about upskilling the gems and jewelry trade to help them understand um, and to become sort of pure gemologists, to understand um, and distinguish between natural gemstone synthetics, treatments and so on. And those individuals that then complete their qualifications, um, they go on to work into different professions within the gems and jewellery industry, but they also become fellows of the Gemological Association, i.e. our members. Um, So there are two core functions that GEMA serves. There's education in gemology, uh, and then of course once you have the education, once you've got the qualification, you then become members. So we do also have a lot of membership services as well, uh, where we develop, where we produce eight publications a year. So one of them is the Journal of Gemology, which is a more scientific and academic publication. We got four of those each year. And then we've got the more trade magazine, which is called Gems and Jewelry, which is, um, again, four issues every year that we produce. In addition to that, like any professional organization, you know, we do loads of events, uh, um, obviously with COVID, etc. We now do quite a few webinars, etc. for our members as well. We've got the annual Gemmy conference that's delivered in London uh, each year. Um, but we're also obviously constantly looking at what more can we do to um, for our members, but I'm sure we'll come to that uh, later on. So. What do I do for GEMA? I'm the Chief Operating Officer there. Uh, come from a management consulting background myself. Um, um, I sort of happen to find myself within the professional membership sector. Um, uh, I, used to, I used to work in research and then from there I moved on to working for a not-for-profit organisation um, where they were essentially delivering supplementary education for uh, secondary students in humanities. Uh, and I was essentially managing the implementation of the program in over 20 countries. And then from there I moved on to another professional organization that was all to do with business continuity and resilience. And then from there, of course, you know, I found myself at Gemma and I've been there coming on five years now. Um, I have quite a wide ranging role um, at Gemma. I look after obviously the financial robustness of the organization, I look after our governance um, um, and compliance or legal, HR, all of those aspects. But the more exciting aspects is obviously I do look after our education and membership as well. Um, uh, so we've got, uh, we've got quite a few departments in GEMA that I, I actually have oversight of. Okay, very, very interesting organizational story as well and, and your personal story. And I'll, I'll, I'll dig a little deeper on, on each one separately, but uh, going back to the story of Gem A, because uh, you guys are also a charity, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, at what point, from its inception, at what point did you start to identify as a membership organisation in terms of, uh, or did the organisation start to identify as a membership organisation, or was that something from mm. from the outset? 
Um, I think from the offset it was very much in a membership organisation because it was the idea of looking at traders within the gems and jewellery industry, um, uh, you know, uh, um, gemstone dealers, uh, jewellery designers, etc., who needed to have an understanding of gemology to be able to be successful in whatever discipline that they were in within the industry. Um, it was it was GEMA provided them with a platform to actually come together and have that exchange of knowledge, exchange of ideas, and build that kind of community. Of course, the foundation around the foundation around that setup was to do with um, uh, you know upskilling and and giving the trade the much needed knowledge of being able to distinguish between natural and synthetic gemstones. So that obviously formed the basis of it. So education has always been a strong emphasis for GEMA. Um, but if you look at how we were incorporated as a charity around, I think it was in the 1960s, if I'm not mistaken, um, um, our, well, you know, our core function is that of a membership organisation. Um, we've, we've, um, we back in the days also used to be a lab, so we used to actually grade uh, and value gemstones as well, but that, that lab also shut down uh, a couple of years ago, so I think back in the days we were called GAGTL. Um, which is actually a gemstone laboratory and testing centre as well, but we don't we don't do that anymore, and we're focusing purely on a charitable purpose of you know uh, education and membership. Okay, uh, very very interesting. I mean, since we met, I've been fascinated. We work with a lot of membership organisations across lots of verticals, but I think that the context that you guys work within is is mm. fascinating. I think we've. I've, been to your library, I've, I've been to yes. your offices and there's the sense of history um, mm. and, and real integrity in everything that you guys do. Um, who would be a typical member of your organisation? You've already mentioned jewellers. Uh, mm -hmm. Are we talking specifically individuals or do you have businesses as members? Mm -hmm. What Who would be a typical member? Um, all sorts. I mean, uh, we've got um, different types of memberships available at uh, GEMA. Um, so the core of our membership will be individual members, but we also do have corporate members. Um, um, corporate members, if I talk about them first, they generally tend to be from the gems and jewellery industry um, uh, who want to be associated with the organisation to, uh, to, to sort of stay connected in terms of, you know, uh, uh, having that connection with um, uh, being able to access the knowledge uh, and and um, a thought leadership that comes from GMA and, and having easy access to that. So they generally tend to be from the gems and jewellery industry. But when we look at individual members, we've got all sorts. So we've got something called associate members. These are essentially individuals that haven't completed their qualification with GMA. So, you know, I was alluding to our gemology diploma or our diamond diploma. They haven't done that. Um, yet they're interested in GEMA, um, they, they, <clears throat> they want to access the benefits that GEMA has to offer um, and they therefore become associate members so they're not able to use our FGA DJ credentials because they're not fully qualified but they can still get all the other membership benefits com that comes from being with the organisation. Um, you find that those could be individuals that are generally hobbyists, that just generally interested in gems, gemstones and just are passionate about it. Um, and, and want to learn about it and, and they find out about GEMA and they become associate members. Um, you also have those individuals that are within the industry but don't necessarily need to do our qualifications mm -hmm. um, um, but they still want to be associated with the association and um, they become associate members. But then the core of our members are those individuals that have completed their foundation and diploma or their diamond diploma um, and become fully qualified members of the association. They're actively working within the industry. Now, when I say sort of um, the gems and jewellery industry, I mean, there's so many different things that you can do within that. I mean, you know, we generally talk about like retailers and gemstone, um, uh, gemstone dealers and designers, etc. But, you know, you've got miners, you've got researchers, you've got lab technicians. There's so many different things that you can actually do within the gems trade. Um, and those are essentially individuals that will come to GEMA, do their qualification, and then they stay on with us. But we equally also have those individuals that have, you know, we've, we've got a small uh, membership base, but the number of people we've trained over, over you know, our history is a lot, um, lot bigger. 
but they've essentially been individuals that have come with um, come to Germany, they've studied with us, but they've not necessarily stayed on with us as members. Yeah. And we call them our alumni, and it's, you know, we at Germain are now actively looking at not just engaging with our immediate member community or those people that are paying their subscriptions to Germain on an annual basis, but essentially the wider alumni, the wider community that we've created as a result of um, individuals that have come and studied with Germain over X number of years. Okay, I interesting. So, <coughs> so for individuals within the industry, there is a, a key point within their uh, working life at which they mm. they they work closely with you, mm. predominantly from an educational aspect. But it's not uh, it's not necessarily a lifelong commitment or or, or no. something that's consistent throughout. Which is. In, in some membership organisations, it's almost a requirement yes. um, to be a part of that organisation um, or be a part of that network. Um, so, you you also mentioned that you you're the Gemological Association of Great Britain, but you have an international focus. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> So is that is that something that's come about recently that's been around for? No, no, I think we're always called the Gemological Association of Great Britain. It's amazing how much the Great Britain name can be attractive to, um, to yeah exactly and very prestigious um, uh, to an international market, especially you know we've got a huge market uh, in um, in in Southeast Asia and uh, you know China and and, and those those sort of uh, regions. Um, we've always been the Gemological Association of Great Britain, um, but I think it's that heritage, that brand, that integrity, um, that also makes us, uh, you know, the partner of choice. Uh, when you look at sort of gemology qualifications, um, you know, our qualifications are known to be um, scientifically robust, mm -hmm. technical. Uh, you know, uh, there's always this. Um, understanding that when someone does their gem qualification if you give them a gemstone they'll be able to tell you exactly what that gemstone is whether it's a natural whether it's a synthetic but it's been you know it's is it treated is it um, uh, you know is it simulant they will be able to tell you because that's how well they get trained when they when they study with us and that's in a way our USP in terms of you know if you're really serious about being a gemologist then of course you know you'll be looking at um, the Gemological Association of Great Britain or GEMA to, um, to do your qualification. Yeah, <coughs> and you only have one real competitor, if I mm -hmm. remember, remember rightly, so would you say that you're the leader in the market? Um, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily like the word competitor, I mean I would say that okay. we've got uh, you know, we've got quite a few other organisations that also provide gemology qualifications, but when it comes to the scientific robustness and the technical robustness of the qualification, then yes, we are uh, leaders uh, within the industry um, and our qualifications are very well known, they're very well respected, um, although like you said, you know, our qualifications are not a must-have, like it is for many other, uh, you know, if you're studying to become an accountant or a lawyer, you need to study uh, with sort of, you know, whichever professional body it is that you choose. We're not like that. But if there are organisations that are looking for individuals with gemological qualifications, I mean the FGADJ qualification is the first one that they'll be they'll be looking at and respecting. We've got the Gemological Institute of America, um, uh, which is uh, you know one of the biggest sort of diamond grading labs uh, in the world. As we all know, all diamonds are pretty much graded by. Um, um, by GIS is a very well known and very well respected name. I must add that the uh, individual, I believe Robert Shipley, mm -hmm. who set up uh, GIA was actually trained at GEMA okay. and is a GEMA graduate. It's almost um, like an offshoot. It's almost <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I, we don't necessarily like to call the GIA qualifications um, as a competition to GEMA. Uh, we very much like to say that it's complementary to GEMA. Mm -hmm. um, they both qualifications try to achieve two very different things. Uh, you know, the GI qualifications could perhaps be more focused on, like, you know, the retail side of things, mm -hmm. along with sort of gemological aspects, and ours are more scientific and technical. So we always find within the trade that there will be individuals that will do the GEM A course and also the GIA course and vice versa. So we don't necessarily think that it's always like one or the other, and uh, it's, it's, it's quite often complementary, and we've got loads of our members that have done both qualifications. So, with such a such a long history, there's, there's you know, there's clearly 
a way in which GMA has provided benefits to its members over mm. the years, uh, mm. you know, education, events, publications mm. that I presume at some point will print publications. Mm. Um, how well um, do you feel that the organization has adapted to uh, interacting with its community and providing benefits to members through use of digital technologies rather than traditional physical in-person yeah. methods? Um, I mean, you know, organisations like GEMA um, that have a very long history, that have been around for many years, um, you always find yourself at a cost where you have to make some very, uh, very sort of quick decisions in terms of how are you going to uh, bring your organisation pretty much into the 21st century and, and leverage some of the technology, at, uh, um, uh, technological options that are available out there today. Uh, in terms of providing value to your members. I think value has become a really important concept within the organisation, like what value are we giving to our students, what value are we giving to our members. And um, yeah, for GMA, I think uh, COVID, in, you know, we were already starting to talk about uh, you know, some of the digital technologies, etc., that we might be able to leverage to give more to our members. Um, but pre-COVID, we were very much an organisation where we were all about face-to-face -face events, uh, you know, our annual conference, which was face-to-face. -face. Um, all our publications were print that were sent out to all the members. Um, like I said, you know, four of the journal, four of the gems and jewellery, so eight magazines and eight, um, uh, eight sorry, eight, um, eight uh, sort of publications that were sent out to our members on an annual basis. It was all, um, it was very different um, uh, in terms of what happened uh, pre-2020. But after 2020, I think we had to aggressively push to leverage some of the digital opportunities that were available to us. Um, so, for example, you know, some of the things that we started doing was um, uh, we, we moved up one of our publications online. Uh, so rather than doing it in print, we were making it available to members online so they'll be able to read um, the publications um, and they're not necessarily at the mercy of like, you know, the, the delivery of um, the, the magazine to the doorstep, um, especially while we were in all these lockdowns, etc. Um, we also started delivering, knowing that our members will not be able to meet face to face, that we're not going to be able to have a conference. We we started delivering these Wednesday webinars, which were hugely successful. Um, we attracted, and and this was something also that we said um, um, that we're not going to make it available just to our members, but just the wider trade as well. Um, and we opened it up for everybody. We made it. And this was mid pandemic. This, this was, was mid pandemic. pandemic. So this was okay. literally all during 2020. Um, and we're like, you know, it's going to be available for free to anybody who's interested to come and join and, and listen to these webinars. Um, so we were delivering like webinars pretty much every Wednesday and we were attracting, you know, for some of the webinars, four or five hundred people um, um, logged in at any given time. Um, we also then would obviously edit those webinars and then upload those onto a YouTube channel and make them available for even those individuals that haven't been able to join live. Um, um, uh, we also started with, you know, in 2021, we delivered a first online conference, for example. And back in the days, we'd have never thought of doing something like that. Um, um, but I think, like, you know, with, with COVID and with sort of the available technologies, um, we were actually able to do that and do that quite successfully. And the exciting thing was, you know, in the past, we've always been told, oh, you know, GEMA is a very UK centric organisation. Mm -hmm. A lot of the events, etc., that you tend to have are all UK based, more specifically London based, because that's where our offices are. Um, and I think doing the conference online, doing these webinars online actually made us reach out to our members far and wide, our alumni far and wide, and, and, and bring them into this community fold. And that's been, that's been a truly exciting um, uh, change, of, um, change of direction for GMA in terms of how we engage with our members, how we engage with our wider community and those individuals that are interested in, the, uh, uh, interested in what the association actually does. Um, so now we're also looking at other ways in which we can leverage some of these digital opportunities for GMA, such as, um, I don't know if you want me to. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah right. Um, so I think some of the things that we're looking at is creating like an online community, an online portal that all our members can basically 
uh, uh, come together on in a digital space to talk to each other, share ideas, ask questions, engage in forum discussions, but also a place where they can potentially, um, uh, uh, you know, search for jobs, uh -huh. uh, make known that they're looking for a job. Uh, so creating that kind of network that can really be useful for our members. And that's the value that we're thinking of, that apart from, you know, being able to use your FGA, DJ post nominals after your name because you're a paid up member, what's the actual value that we're giving you? Well, you know, you've got your publications, that's great, which forms part of the continuing professional development. Uh, but in addition to that, yes, we're still going to do the face-to-face -face events. You know, we returned back to some of our face-to-face -face events last year. Um, but we're also going to give you this digital space that you can all come together in and communicate with each other and learn from one another. Um, um, and, and I think that sort of platform then becomes a really powerful tool for our members to feel uh, valued and that they're actually gaining something from the association. So you're actually going to be facilitating um, a digital platform that's mm -hmm. going to enable your community to collaborate amongst themselves. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, I think you touched on the pandemic, and I think that within the membership uh, within the membership sector and, and all sectors, but but very much so within membership sector, that the pandemic has very much been a catalyst uh, yes. that's, that's forced progress because I think with especially more established organizations like yourself one of the big it, it, change is a challenge from a cultural mm -hmm. perspective from an operational perspective um, mm -hmm. where I think that that's, it, it may be even required something like the pandemic to trigger a reaction exactly. of organizational change yeah you know to be honest it was a long time coming mm -hmm. um you know um in well around sort of uh um uh 20 when was it 2017 2018 um i was pursuing a master's from ucl mm -hmm. and as part of my dissertation uh i i did research on like opportunities and challenges for leaders within a professional and membership organization setup um, and even then, sort of, you know, when I did that research, some of these ideas were very much coming up, and this was pre-pandemic. Um, you know, when you when you look at membership organisations, especially those like Germay that were formed in the late 1800s, 1900s, um, you know, you didn't you didn't really have technology then. You didn't have the internet. You didn't have um, you didn't have phones, etc. That you could um, you could really sort of go and find information or learn something. Or, uh, and at that time, sort of forming these kind of organisations that allows people to come together in a formal setup, in a formal gathering, and learn from each other was a very powerful tool and it works really well and of course you know these professional organizations have been very successful in achieving sort of what they wanted to achieve uh, in terms of upskilling the trade setting the standards for the trade um, you know, whichever trade it is that they that they belonged in and, and that was fantastic and it was a great opportunity for people to network um, with sort of technological advances and, uh, and so on, uh, you know, I have to mention things like LinkedIn um, mm -hmm. and, and Google, where you've now got sort of like an online community that you can subscribe to, where you can connect with like-minded people within your, within your industry or even outside your industry, where you might have transferable skills or cross-fertilization that might happen. You can easily connect with those people, network with those people. You go onto Google, you can find information. So professional bodies then need to, you know, one of the things that was coming out from my research was then professional bodies need to say, what more are we giving to our members and to potential individuals that might want to engage with our with the organization from what they can't find on, say, Google or LinkedIn and so on. Um, and that's that's essentially like what many, and especially those professional bodies like GEMA, where they're a nice to have and not a must have, they're particularly grappling with, you know, what, what are we giving to? Uh, to the community now uh, that sort of would make them engage with us and that's why this sort of leveraging of digital uh, technologies and, and leveraging sort of um, uh, the, the benefits of what technology can give us I think has become very important for organisations and I think that most professional bodies again like Germain knew that they had to do that but many a times you know change as you said it can be slow it can be, it can be scary so it didn't happen at the pace that we would have liked it to happen at but then COVID happened and that's when we were, of course, you know, pushed to make those changes a lot quicker. And I think, you know, I always like to see opportunities and adversity. And, you know, while COVID has been a very difficult time for all of us, 
from there has emerged loads of opportunities that I think has really transformed many organisations and will continue to do so. Yeah, I think historically we'll remember it as probably the most transformational yeah, time. Absolutely. Um, certainly in, in recorded history up till now, mm. as far and, and certainly as far as technology is concerned. Uh, but but yeah, and it's not just about what the organisation knew saw as opportunities. It's it's the expectations mm. that your members and and the general public mm. are going to have. Everybody's become um, more adept at doing things online mm, uh, and you've got more competition because there's so much knowledge available exactly. online so so it's almost yep. there's no such thing when it comes to certainly digital evolution as I like to call it there's no such thing as standing still you're either moving forward or you're moving backwards yep. but, you, but, but sometimes you have to be moving forward just to stay still in terms Absolutely. of the relevance that you it's have. Your survival depends on it now I mean we're in a very competitive uh, we're, we're in a very competitive environment there's loads of you know the the external pestle factors like I like to call it there's there's many of those um, and I think if you know organization doesn't adapt doesn't pivot um, to sort of you know some of these challenges that we see around us I think we risk becoming obsolete um, I think the other thing that um, I think is also quite quite important to consider is um, the younger members younger individuals that are yeah. coming within the gems and jewelry trade you know how do you make them see that this is an exciting industry to be part of how do you get them to see that you can actually make a really successful career for yourself within the gems and jewelry trade how do you bring them within the fold how do you bring them to engage with the association i mean these are huge challenges for us today and yes you know we have conversations about um, perhaps reaching out to schools and universities um, you know we've developed an online qualification now um, which is sort of like an introduction to gemology that's available um, for for individuals to sort of get an initial taster of what studying gemology is all about as a science and then of course if you're interested you could go on to do a more kind of formal qualifications it's it's about the organization again looking at ways in which you can bring younger members to also engage with the association because ultimately they're the future yeah what, what we see across the sector is you know you've got internal organizational change that, mm. that can be cultural technological mm. operational mm. Um, but then there's also the audience and the reluctance mm. of uh, an audience to also change in mm. sync um, with the organization um, so, so you know a lot of organizations by doing too much too quickly can alienate a, a, mm a more seasoned uh, membership audience let's say um, so what, what we're seeing a lot is the generational um, evolution of the your, your, your membership portfolio so mm. to speak uh, or your member portfolio uh, the younger members have expectations and are more likely to engage with you through more modern mechanisms exactly. that, that they're more adept to. Um, so, do you see? Do you see? Have you seen as you've moved more towards digital engagement? Have you seen any sort of a shift in in the typical profile of your members? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, we we are seeing younger members now engage with GMA, mm -hmm. um, especially when we were delivering the webinars. And now, obviously, with this new qualification that we've launched, that's fully online, uh, we are seeing sort of younger members coming in to do our qualifications. Um, uh, and, and I think that's, that's, been, that's been a huge success for Gemme. Um, you know, I mean, touching, touching on the point that you made um, earlier, um, in that, 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 that was essentially spot on, is that we realized that, you know, there was that audience shift that we needed. Uh, and of course, you know, we value the members that we have, we really value the members that we have, but also we want to attract, uh, you know, fresh blood to come into the industry and 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 to because you know and to and to add and contribute to the industry and uh, a lot of these sort of digital strategies that we've employed over the last sort of couple of years has been very much keeping in mind as to how do we get these younger individuals to see um, uh, and and be excited by what GMA actually has to offer or what the industry actually has to offer but we also knew that you know um, because again like you know we're, we're quite an old organization there were changes that we needed to make internally before we could make an external uh, impact and over over sort of like the last two years we've also gone through a lot of internal change as you as you mentioned we've done a completely IT infrastructure overhaul 
um, uh, you know, we've, we've looked at a lot of our own internal process in terms of how we deliver our education, how we deliver our membership and make changes to those. Um, and I think in doing some of these changes uh, and in doing some of these transformation projects, we, we now feel that, you know, we're at a better footing in terms of now making a difference to uh, what it is that we're offering to our members and what it is that we're going to be offering to our um, audiences that we want uh, that we want over time to engage with the association. I think one of the things that stood out. So, so we mm. we've known each other about coming up to a year now. I, I think, think so, since yeah. we initially interacted, and I remember in one of our first meetings we talked about your membership model, and and we'd made some comments about some tweaks that could potentially be made within that to make it more. Uh, adaptable mm. to 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 maximising the your achievements and and as far as digital engagement is concerned, and then a few months later when we'd spoken, we realised that that change had had already happened, okay. and we talk a lot about digital transformation within the sector. And typically, you know, with the digital transformation, you've got you've got three key phases. You've got uh, digitization and then you've got digitalization mm. and then you've got digital transformation and a lot mm. of people don't even understand the difference be between the mm. three. Um, but ultimately the objective of digital transformation is to transform the way in which the organization operates and to change mm. the processes within the organization mm. uh, by utilizing the capabilities of digital technologies. Mm. Um, what a lot of organizations are doing is just digitalizing their existing processes and, and, and ways of, of doing things. Mm. Um, so with regards to the way in which you operate, uh, other, rather than just doing the same online, is there any things that you're doing now that wouldn't have been possible before? Um, oh, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, you know, um, we are, when I talk about, I mean, with membership certainly, uh, we, are, we are doing things um, online that we wouldn't have done uh, in the past. Like I said, for example, you know, we delivered our annual conference, which is a major event for GEMA. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we delivered that online back in 2021 and it was hugely successful. Uh, it is something that we'd consider doing again for our members because it did enable members from all around the world to attend who generally would not be able to attend because it's you know, coming coming to London, etc., and the challenges with that. Um, so I think that was hugely successful and we would do something like that again. Um, education, it's slightly trickier because we are a practical, hands-on subject. Yeah. Um, you know, it involves handling gemstones, it involves working with different instruments, etc. There are certain parts of our qualification that we can deliver online, but then there are certain parts that we can't. The practical element has to very much be done in person and that's actually been one of the challenges for us as an association especially during the pandemic because um, we could easily move the theoretical aspects of our qualification online yeah. so that was again something that we wouldn't have done in the past because it was very much like all our teaching centers globally teach our qualifications face to face this idea of like you know student coming into the classroom they get the theory and while they're studying the theory they also handle loads of gemstones but then when COVID happened, we realized, well, hang on a second, can't do that. How about we move to continue sort of the training of our students? Let's move all the theory aspects of the course online. Again, use digital technologies that are available out there to be able to deliver courses online. But then we could not do that with the practical. Um, so that's always been a bit of a challenge for us. It's the same with exams. Um, um, our exams are, you know, they're the theory based and practical based. We could consider doing some of the theoretical elements of our examination online. Uh, even that's marred with challenges and I can, I can talk about that because, you know, it involves doing things like diagrams and graphs, etc. Which is something not easily done if you're doing it via an online platform. Um, um, but we certainly, again, can't do our practical exams online. It's, uh, so education and digitally transforming our education side of things has been slightly trickier. Mm -hmm. Where we have been able to take things online, we've done that. And even post-COVID, we're still allowing some of our teaching centers now to continue teaching the theoretical aspects of the course online. But of course, for the practical, um, that's one thing where we would not make any concession. You have to study the practical in person 
And, and every qualification has an element of theoretical and practical, I presume. Absolutely. So okay. this was, again, one of the reasons why we developed Gem Intro. The idea was that, you know, it's an introduction to gemology. Um, uh, you know, we're just going to give you a flavour of what mm -hmm. gemology is all about. It's fully online. Um, there's no practical element to the qualification. Um, the theory exam is pretty straightforward. Multiple choice questions at the end of it. And when you finish the course, you get 80%. Uh, and then you get a level two off-course certificate from GMA, fantastic. And then if you're a retailer, etc., you can use that to upskill your staff um, uh, so that they have a bit of an appreciation of gemstones, so they can talk to consumers uh, confidently um, and, and, um, and, and do a good job, and that's perfect. But as soon as you go to our main qualifications, the foundation, the diploma, the gemology diploma, and the diamond, absolutely, you can't do it without the practical. Um, that's, that's, that's a very important aspect of, of the qualifications, unfortunately. Um, that's where digital transformation has been slightly tricky for us. Yeah, that's, so you've got some sort of a hybrid exactly. cocktail of it, but yeah. the bottleneck is still the fact that it's everybody the needs to. Yeah. You know, we, we talked about, you know, we, we had some, some of our teaching centres that came up with creative ideas of like, you know, oh, we can have sort of like a setup where we can actually show them how to use an instrument online. Mm -hmm. And we're like, well, yes, that's fine. But ultimately, the student needs to be able to play with the instrument and, and test it with different gemstones. Because the, the, the whole idea of gemology is the more you practice it, the better you get at it. Yeah. And that's what we need to give to our students. I mean, you know, Gem A, we've got a huge uh, uh, stone collection. And the idea very much is that when students come to study at Gem A in London, uh, we open up our entire stone collection for our students to basically work with, test, um, and that's how they get proficient and that's how they do well in the ex not, not, not just in their exams but also when they go work in the trade and that's a very important aspect which we cannot take away from our students. Yeah, there's, <coughs> it's interesting, you're not the only ones with the same problem. Right? Yeah. As you know, we work with a few um, membership organisations in the medical sector yes. that also provide training and education to mm. doctors, surgeons mm. and uh, yeah, it's it's uh, that they have similar Tricky. challenges. You yeah. know how how do you teach somebody to operate potentially uh, remotely yeah. without them having that yeah. experience? Um, that being said, you know you, you are very much um, forward thinking, and you've touched onto this plan for the new portal that that you guys mm. are currently working on. Um, what are you seeing as the biggest challenges in? knowing where you want to be and implementing the vision that you want to move to from the status quo and where things are from from a technical infrastructure and and uh, let's say technological debt perspective mm. i think it's the complexity of the organization and what it is that we offer i mean you know we're a small organization uh, uh limited in resources uh you know we our 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 vision is very aspirational mm -hmm. um but, but, you know, every time we then look at the resources that we have available, we are truly humbled um, uh, in, in terms of, like, you know, how it is that we're going to get to that. But, you know, it's about taking those incremental steps to get to ultimately where you need to be over sort of the next couple of years. Um, for us, I think, in terms of the, the digital um, transformation that we're going, um, going through at the moment, so we're in the process of developing, as you know, uh, developing a new website, and as part of that, we're also developing this membership platform that will be integrated into the website. I think the integration piece is going to be key for us mm -hmm. in terms of how do all the different systems that we have, how are they going to talk to each other, because ultimately we want to create a seamless user journey for anybody that's visiting the GEMA website, for a member that's visiting, that's logging into their membership portal, or a student that's trying to access information about their, their qualifications or to register with GEMA. So how all of that's going to work really seamlessly. Um, you know, we all have our ideas uh, within the organisation in terms of how that's going to look like, and many a times these ideas might be um, might not necessarily align. And I think that's one of the challenges that we have: that how do we go through that discovery process, where we of course you know want to consult with our staff because they're the ones that are performing these different roles and know the kind of things that say within the education team that students are looking for, or within membership that the members are looking for. So accessing all of that expertise and accessing sort of like you know understanding all those different expectations and creating that um, uh, uh, how do you say it creating sort of you know um, 
uh, the, the, the digital space yeah. that is going to achieve the vision of what we're trying to do as an organization, I think that's going to be the most challenging process. And I think um, the other thing for us is also that, you know, as part of the, as part of the web development process, we're also, we're also going through a full rebrand. Mm -hmm. Uh, so again, that's a really big conversation that we need to have in terms of, you know, um, we're, we're, a, we're, a, we're an old organization, we've got a lot of history, uh, uh, we've got a lot of, like, you know, um, past successes, um, um, uh, th there's that heritage that we need to build on, and we need to make sure that we maintain that, we maintain that rich heritage, but we have that more modern outlook, so what is the new brand going to look like? And how is that then going to feed into the website that we're developing and so on? So I think those are some of the challenging conversations that we're having within the organization and consolidating all different thoughts from sort of, you know, our trustees, um, senior management team, our staff, uh, all these other different partners that we're working with uh, to then create one seamless voice that will then reflect into the, um, the end product. Yeah. It we always say it, it's an event, uh, mm. sorry, it's a, it's a process, it's mm. not an event. Mm. Um, and it's something that you can achieve in increments over mm. a long period of time. Do you find that as an organization you've got, because a membership organization can sometimes be political, can sometimes be challenging to um, get the support that you need to execute a vision, no doubt you have a very good vision and an insight into where you want to be. Do you find that you're getting the right level of support within the organisation uh, to do that, or has that also been a hurdle that that you've needed to overcome? Look, any any sort of you know, I don't think there's any organisation that's devoid of uh, um, uh, uh, you know um, politics and things like that. I think um, uh, it's it's just it's just. Um, uh, it, it's just some. It's just part of like you know natural process of you know being part of an organisation, being human really. Um, I think um, despite these challenges, I th uh, the important thing is for us to come together as a team, and 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 I think this is essentially what we're trying to do within the organisation is try to bring everyone together towards that common understanding of what it is that we need to achieve. Um, uh, again, like I said, it's not without its challenges. Of course, we get loads of hurdles. Resources has always been uh, a huge hurdle for Gemma in terms of you know what we're trying to achieve. Um, but we've got a good staff base now. Uh, I think we've got very supportive trustees who share our vision uh, in terms of what it is that we're trying to achieve and are supportive of it. Um, and I think together we will be, we'll hopefully be able to, we'll hopefully be able to do something good. Um, yeah, so if, assuming you didn't have the, the bottlenecks and the, the constraints in terms of budget and resources, um, what's your, uh, in an idealistic view, what do you see are the biggest opportunities uh, from a digital perspective? You know, what's, what's the end goal? What's your oh, wow. vision? Oh, the possibilities are endless. I mean, if I sort of do a brain dump of all my ideas um, that I'd love to do for Gemma, um, uh, you know, um, Obviously, like you know, developing this new website um, where the user journey is absolutely seamless. Um, we've got this membership engagement portal uh, where our members globally can interact. But the idea of the portal is not just about our members, but like I said, you know, the wider community. So, like we would give our alumni access to the portal as well. Um, but obviously, there would be certain restricted access and so on. But you know, creating that kind of larger, um, uh, larger community that would come onto the Gemma website and interact and engage. Uh, with each other. Um, I'd love to sort of look at ways in which we can streamline some of our education processes um, from a digital point of view. So I know I said that, you know, there's a complexity in terms of delivering education um, through sort of, you know, digital technology. But there are things that I'd love to do in terms of how we actually do a registration process. I mean, a lot of a registration process to date is quite manual. Um, how can we then use digital platforms to make that process a bit easier, not just for us internally, but also those individuals externally, including our teaching centres that register hundreds of students with us every year. So I'd love yeah. to do that, and that's a that's a big project in its own sense. I'd love to sort of look at more um, social media outreach. Mm -hmm. um, so at the moment, a lot of the stuff that we do on our on our social media is quite static, mm -hmm. uh, images, etc. But I'd love to bring in more videos, uh, more kind of like. Um, <clears throat> 
um, yeah, more, more videos, more interactivity, something that's a bit more dynamic. Uh, so sharing more content, uh, creating more content, like for example, something like a podcast. Um, that would, I'd yeah. love to do things like that for Jemmy. Uh, having more regular webinars, etc. You're, that welcome, we can, you're welcome to use our set. Yeah, that, that, would be, <laughs> that would be brilliant. I mean, to be able to do some of these things, that I, again, it's about giving that value. Uh, to our members, to our community, to be able to upload gemology-related podcasts onto onto our membership portal, to you know do more regular webinars that we can then make available to our members. Um, I'd love to also introduce some kind of like mentoring scheme um, where you know we've got got huge and tremendous expertise within within our membership. Yeah. You know members who are just absolutely fantastic and have done some amazing things and have got great profiles. And the alumni um, as yeah, well. Absolutely, yeah. and it's like you know how can we how can we bring some of these individuals to to nurture some of the budding gemologists that we have within the association. So looking at some kind of, and again, leveraging digital platforms and technology to perhaps bring some kind of mentoring scheme, etc. So I mean, you know, we've got ideas galore, um, but of course, you know, we're, we're very mindful in terms of um, what it is that we can achieve, and we don't want to, um, we don't want to create sort of like organisation fatigue by going through too much change and trying to do too many things at the same time because the danger in that especially when you're limited with resources is that you'll be successful at nothing yeah. um, and, and we at GEMA if we do something we like to do it sort of top quality uh, which is evident from like you know the GEM intra qualification that we've put together um, so I think it's about sort of you know it's all in our plan and it's about how we can how we can sort of achieve them over sort of our next five to ten years um, uh, is, is, is something that, you know, and that sort of mind map in terms of how we're going to achieve these things, um, uh, it's, it's something that we're very much working on. Well, from the conversations I've had with you so far, I think, um, I think it's definitely going uh, in the right direction and you. Um, you, you've got the right mindset um, to, to get to where you need to get. Um, one uh, one final question, one final thought before before we wrap it up, because I, I, I could talk to you for, yeah. for many more hours. Um, what do you think are going to be the next, uh, the, the biggest three things uh, in terms of uh, capitalising on current trends uh, for GMA in, in, in the next year or so? Oh, um, uh, I think definitely sort of looking at things like social media for us is going to be quite key. Um, you know, we've been we've been talking about things like TikTok, etc., and how can we create that kind of quick kind of you know video content that will be exciting, especially when you know we talked about like a younger audience base as well to sort of attract them to to the association. I think that's definitely something that we see ourselves doing um, um, uh, over sort of like you know the near near future. So how we sort of transform some of our social media channels, uh, I think that's definitely something that we need to look at and capitalize on because it's opportunities galore when it comes to what it is that you can do with social media and actually be hugely successful as well. Um, so that's, that's definitely one thing. The second is obviously our website. Uh, it, is our, it is after all, the, 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 it's the website that tells people who we are. Uh, it represents us. It's that place where people can find information about Gemme, and we obviously need to make sure that the website's top notch and uh, uh, something where people can easily find information and actually keep coming back to. So it's not just about sort of providing information about this is what Gemme is, and you know this is what we do. You know, register on a course, register to become a member. member but more sort of like a place people come back to because they're getting exciting content on our website that you know through that they're getting a platform that they can engage on through our websites that's definitely something that we want to capitalize on um, and we know it's something that we'll have to build incrementally over the next sort of couple of years um, I think the third thing I would say is definitely in terms of um, being a thought leader within the gems and jewelry within the industry um, and you know setting those sort of standards um, there's lots of information out there um, there's a lot of um, uh, you know and we talk about it all the time in terms of you know sometimes cons you know consumers are very well informed now because you've got the internet if you if you're looking to buy an engagement ring you know you can go online and you can do all sorts of research in terms of available option and what works and what doesn't work and so on um, but you know we want to be able to look at all and but there's also a lot of incorrect information out there that people don't necessarily know how to sort of judge between what's correct and what's not correct 
we Gemma, want to be that hub of you know the dissemination of knowledge and um, when it comes to uh, uh, gemology through our publications, through the content that we develop, that we disseminate through our website, our social media channels and so on. So definitely want to be a thought leader in that sense as well and, and leveraging sort of some of the industry experts um, uh, to sort of bring that thought knowledge and expertise um, from GMA to sort of people. Uh, I think that's definitely something that we want to capitalise on quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. so you, you want to become the platform that facilitates... Exactly. Um, capability for, for for knowledge to be shared yeah. so uh, it's been great chatting to you thank you for coming thank you, thank on you for um, me. very fascinating conversation as always um, I, I, I wish you the best of luck over the, the next couple of years as far thank as you. transformations concerned and I look forward to picking up and, and on this conversation I'd and seeing to. how we're, how we're getting along a year down the line I'd love to. Um, and I'm sure in the meantime we'll, we'll be collaborating and working together in, in some sort of capacity to help each other absolutely I mean you know at GRM Digital I mean I've seen the kind of work that you guys do I mean you've obviously done some work for Gemma already in terms of the audit etc so I obviously wish you guys all the success as well and absolutely I'm sure there'll be opportunities for us to collaborate as you know there's so much that needs to be done at GEMA and you guys have a lot of expertise around some of the conversations that we've been having today so we'd love to be able to collaborate with you guys in the future for sure I, I'm thank sure you so well much. and thank you for the positive feedback I, I look forward to to help in whatever way we can. Absolutely. Um, great, thanks for coming. Thank you. Nice.